Yes, my name's Reza Rasul, um, but I want to make some changes. Um, I hope this is not a bait and switch. I'm no longer CTO of Real Networks. Um, I'm now a fellow of Real Networks. What does that mean? It's just an alum. It's an unpaid position. Um, in the intervening time since I, I left there, I've now uh, become CTO of Business Wire, a Berkshire Hathaway corporation. But you know, AI is moving so fast. My talk title when I signed up for this keynote was um, how generative AI will change your career. Well, you can see what it's done to my career. Um, <laughs> I, thought, I thought I'd actually go bigger and retitle it, how AI will change the very nature of employment. And specifically, practically, what can you do about it? What can you do about it? So in the time between the two jobs, it was two weeks, um, between leaving Real Networks and starting at Business Wire, I formed an international developer community with the mission of democratizing AI. It's called Kwai, K-W-A-A-I. Hit me up later to find out what the name means. But um, so I didn't get my honey-do list done in the, in the <laughs> meantime. I set up this community. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. This isn't uh, opinions endorsed by either my former or current employer, but I do have their permission to, in addition to my day job, run this um, uh, industry association. Okay, so as you heard from the other speakers, generative AI actually represents a massive leap forward for society and all of us. You know, it's set to transform the very nature of our work. Um, large language models, in fact, allow us all to stand on the shoulders of prior generations. It's reminiscent of the advances humanity made even when writing was invented. That transformed the way in which wisdom got handed down from previous generations. Prior to that, it was through an oral tradition. And then think about how this progressed when that became digital and the internet came along. We could transmit that wisdom a lot faster. LLMs, large language models, just accelerate that even more. So the optimists, and the optimist in me, believes that generative AI will raise all boats. Um, Macroeconomists, even in this institution, will say, hey, don't worry, the pie will get larger. There's a, a spectrum of opinions. You've probably heard Jan LeCun. He's an AI optimist, thinking, don't worry, it's going to raise all boats. Then you've got the other extreme, um, uh, Yuri Ovo, um, the uh, author of uh, Homo Deus. Uh, no, he's got a very pessimistic view. He believes that large language models have actually hacked the very operating system of humans and um, will lead us down a very dystopian path. So what could possibly go wrong? Um, the skeptics would counter the macroeconomists and say, these technical advances, AI included, accelerate the monopolization of the economy, of wealth, and it further um, grows the wealth gap between the rich and the poor. When we look at AI, we see it controlled by maybe a half a dozen corporations. An oligopoly is forming that is typically very dangerous for economies. We know historically monopolies lead to fragility and brittleness of the economy. In fact, in the, in the board game monopoly, when one player owns all of the wealth, what happens? It's game over. And we don't want that for our economy. We don't want that for society, do we? Well, do we? No. I thought I was in the wrong place, the wrong audience, <laughs> to ask that question. But look, this isn't um, a rail against capitalism. The, 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 even though the Kwai white paper is called the Kwai Manifesto, this isn't a rail against capitalism. Other people can do that. This isn't a, a neo-Luddite, knee-jerk reaction to say, hey, let's stop AI. 
nor is this a clickbaity AI doomer warning about the existential threat that AI represents. No, I think that is a distraction from the clear and present danger. The clear and present danger is the threat to the very nature of employment, that sort of deal that we have with our employers. Hey, I'm going to give you my skills for a time, but when I leave the job, you don't still have my skills. That's mine to take on. That thing is playing out right now in Hollywood, right in this town, in the actors and the writers' strike. And it's going to play out in every single job. Every single job where a model can be trained on your work output. If that model is owned by your employer, your very value, your work, your ability, your employability is under threat. So it's the thesis of um, Kwai, the organization, that the landscape, the battleground on which this is playing out in co-pilots, in personal assistants, in digital twins. It's very important that you own your own co-pilot. It's your tools of the trade. If you don't own it, you're actually giving up the pilot seat. So it's a clear and present danger. Look, it's a threat to businesses as well. Monopolization means that small, medium businesses can't play. Um, they all have to pay the extra cloud tax on their business. Sa the SaaS providers of AI are eyeing the recurring revenues they're going to receive. Um, the other threats we can talk about, um, and these are, not, these are just a few of them, um, AI in its current in incarnation has an awful carbon footprint and is really just unsustainable. So the Kwai mission is to democratize AI. How do we do that? Um, well, we do it on three fronts. Before I go into that, maybe a generation ago, the industry was in a similar fragile situation where technology was being monopolized. It was actually in the server operating system space where what were your choices? You had Windows NT, you had a number of proprietary Unix operating systems, and then along comes Linux, a grassroots developer organization that says, no, we're going to create a better operating system that is open source. And now it's the dominant operating system. Not that it's a free for all, not that it's you know, a, a, you know, a massive giveaway. There were wealthy companies built on top of it. Red Hat, the first billion dollar company built on top of open source. So we aim to democratize AI, build um, an international developer community, a think tank. It will have open source outputs, three broad categories, tools. It'll create tools to allow you to train your own co-pilot, one that you can own, one that you can operate yourself, maybe run on your locally on your own mobile device. It'll also make progress in the area of AI fundamentals. It turns out it's the very inefficiencies of the existing AI infrastructure that actually perpetuates the moat around existing AI. It makes it expensive. It means that only the wealthiest deep-pocketed companies can indulge in the large language model training. So we need to make progress on the fundamentals, um, and that is the perceptron. It hasn't changed its design since 1940 when it was uh, first invented. The sort of structures and methodologies and frameworks we have in neural networks are really, really poor. Neural networks are actually slow to converge. They need millions of samples. Um, you have to train in one instance and run inference in another instance. But this two pound biological computer that you all carry around with you can learn and think concurrently in the same instance and can train on much less data than a computer can. So, hey, I think we can do better. And then it's, so the two directions, uh, tools and fundamentals represent 
technical tracks. There is a policy track as well. So it's a technical think tank and a policy think tank. Policy needs to go step by step, hand in glove with technology. So what do those policies mean? It's the, the very language that should go into employment agreements that anticipate AI. Um, how are the rights of those co-pilots that you've maybe trained on the job? How are they apportioned between employer and employee? What are the rights that you grant back to your employer to still have some of your skills after you've left the job? How are those residuals paid back to you? Hey, that's, that's an argument that should be going on in Hollywood right now. Um, Eve, I'm sure you're right on it. Um, the GPL, um, the licensing agreement, there needs to be a GPL for training data for repositories to, to say, hey, I, I want you to you know, extract the embeddings from this, but I'm still holding on to the data. So that's a whole big subject. And then nutrition facts for models that actually help um, give transparency for AI models to say, hey, this is the scope of training data that it was trained on, and here's the accuracy of the model, here's the bias in the model. Um, we don't know that, and so without those certified nutrition facts coming maybe from an industry body, um, we, are, we are running blind. So it's a club. Membership has its privileges. Um, that's my system diagram here of the ecosystem. At the top, enterprises can become members. They pay a fee. Many industry bodies are set up like that. And so depending on the tier of membership, um, will determine what level of access they have to the, out, the output, whether they can in fact direct or even commission new projects within the lab. Volunteers, please join. Um, but also institutions, software houses, um, other labs um, should join and they can contribute their smarts and come back even smarter and uh, get fame and glory. There's enough to go around. Consumers should have access to the outputs of the lab for free, for non-commercial use. For commercial use, they can seek a license. So it's a call to action. Join the movement. Don't just complain and write a blog post about the dangers of AI. Organize. Join up, sign up, go to quai.ai. Um, so who are we looking for? You want to be a lab member? You're an AI rock star. You're a data scientist. You're an ML developer. Maybe you're just someone that's really concerned about it. Maybe you've got marketing skills you can help us. Maybe you can spread the word. Um, you're typically high energy and you're curious and you're concerned, but you're siloed in your current organization. You're itching to contribute to an international development and a movement and make a difference rather than being passive and wringing your hands and fretting about um, the anxiety that you feel about AI. So we're looking for people that can contribute at least eight hours a month. Wow, that's not a lot. That's a joining a weekly call. That's a quarterly summit that might be a day long. Maybe the annual summit's two days. Averages out eight hours a month. If you can contribute that, join up. And if you can contribute more, that's fantastic. Um, look, you can find out about me and the, and the president um, on, on LinkedIn. Uh, Raphael gave me a, um, a good um, introduction. Um, why not come to the Friday calls, 10 a.m.? We'd love to see you there. Um, we've developed uh, an advisory board, but we're growing that advisory board. I think there are going to be many more people on the advisory board. And um, join the movement. Thanks so much.